Oh 
to the heavens Jesus be the center it's all about you yes it's all about you from my heart to the heavens Jesus be the center it's all about church Jesus be the center of your church and every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you Jesus Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm so delighted to come to you with this word today. I enjoyed the presence of God. Uh, we had a great time of uh, prayer and worship last night. Uh, we are all hungry, thirsting after God. We just want to see the Lord do more. And I'm excited for this series, part two of A New Heart. And uh, man, you know, 40 years ago, the Lord changed my heart. Uh, that was huge, you know. At, at, when you when you just begin, you don't even know what it is that you're signing up for. You don't even know what God's going to begin to do. All you know is, uh, or all I knew anyway, was I needed Jesus. I needed I needed what He came to offer. I needed forgiveness. I needed to be set free from some things. And man, when I called, He answered. But I'm so grateful that that wasn't the end. That was the beginning of this incredible journey of God shaping my life. Jeremiah says, he's the potter, we're the clay. Uh, we're just lumps of clay. <laughs> we're just 
cracked vessels. You know, each one's not perfect, but they're shaped and molded. We're just wanting God to shape our heart, shape our life. And so thank you for joining in with me on this second part uh, of uh, this series. I believe Pastor Andy's message last week was right on point, And this week, we're just moving forward in what God wants to speak. Laying hold of the promise. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you and I'll remove from your heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Come on. Anybody here ready for a fresh outpouring of God in your life? A new spirit, a new heart? Yeah, that's what the Lord's promised. We don't have to have our heart clutter with a bunch of stuff. We can be free, we can be forgiven, we can be cleansed and we can uh, enjoy what God has in mind for us. So this morning, I want to uh, look at a a verse in uh, a passage in chapter 3 of Ezekiel. And again, Ezekiel is one of the major prophets. It's uh, one of the big five, if you will, of the the little bit larger books of the Old Testament. And uh, in chapter 3, this is what the word of the Lord said. May the glory of the Lord be praised in his dwelling place. The sound of the wings of these living creatures were brushing each other and the sound of the wheels or loud rumbling sound. So, hey, listen, sometimes in church, it's not always quiet. Sometimes it gets loud. And, and here's the Spirit then lifted me. Come on, that's what we want. We pray the Spirit of God will lift you and t- took me away. And I went in in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord upon me. Come on, that, I'm going to make some sense out of that in a minute. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kibar River, and there, where they were living, I sat among them for seven days overwhelmed. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word, of, the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you, Ezekiel, accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. Since you did not warn him, he will die for his sin. The righteous things he did will not be remembered, but I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he will surely live because he took warning, and you will have saved yourself. The hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said to me, Get up, go out to the plain, and there I will speak to you. So I got up and went to the plain, and the glory of the Lord was standing there like the glory I'd seen by the Kibar River, and I fell face down. It's kind of a pattern. Every time he encounters his glory, he doesn't know how to handle it. He just, boom, (laughs) he's out. Then the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. He spoke to me and said, Go shut yourself inside your house, and you, son of man, they will tie with ropes. You will be bound so that you cannot go out among the people. I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be silent and unable to rebuke them, though they are a rebellious house. But when I do speak to you, I will open your mouth and you'll have something to say. (laughs) This is what the sovereign Lord says. Whoever will listen, let him listen. And whoever will refuse, let him refuse. For they are a rebellious house. Well, let's talk about this today. Ezekiel's a priest. He's anointed to prophesy or speak the word of the Lord to the Israelites who are now in exile in Babylon, modern-day Iraq. The Lord tells Ezekiel, the task I'm assigning you isn't going to be an easy one. He tells them in Ezekiel 3, 7, the house of Israel, they're not willing to listen to you because they're not willing to listen to me. (laughs) Listen, you think you think you got problems. You like to be God of the whole world and have everybody on this planet. God's trying to get their attention and a small percentage, a fraction of the populations even paying any attention to the God who created them, who planted them on this planet. God says, look, don't get so frustrated. You think you're, you know, they're not listening to you because they're not listening to me. And so God has that conversation. 
He says, because the whole house of Israel is hardened and obstinate. Now, these, this is in particular disconcerting because he's talking about the chosen people. He's talking about Abraham's seed. He's talking about the ones he got delivered out of the Red Sea. You know, Charlton Hess, I mean, Moses <laughs> on the, parting the water and the Israelites walking through on dry ground. But God says, I will make you, Ezekiel, as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardened stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. You know, sometimes our assignments are not easy. (laughs) Have you ever had to have a hard conversation with another person? That's Ezekiel's situation. The reality is that the entire nation's in exile because of their hardness of heart, their obstinate way that they've been living for some time because their national focus was off. The whole nation suffered, including Ezekiel. He was a priest in Israel, but now he's unable to perform any of his priestly duties because they have been removed from Jerusalem. It's not even a possibility. He's not in the temple. He can't accomplish what he had been trained to do. He's personally affected at a a deep level. So in some ways, when when we see him express that that he's experiencing God in his life, but it doesn't remove immediately this bitterness and this anger that's within him, he's frustrated. He's not happy where he's at. He's, 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 he's in a difficult time. He's having to have difficult conversations with people who don't really care what he has to say. And he's, he's trying to take all this in. So today you may find yourself in a situation where you've been adversely affected because of the decisions of other people have made. Your company maybe decides to shut down or you've been running a program a certain way, making a difference, making an impact. But all of a sudden, the things, the rules have changed. What you can or can't do is different. You feel limited. You could get that. You can kind of feel with Ezekiel, a little bit of anger, a little bit of frustration, a little bit of bitterness about, well, God, how, how am I even going to do all of this with what's going on how do i handle all of this and so he's 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 feeling that you know we have to sometimes uh you hear of people that are having to work from home they're trying to help their kids with e-learning they used to travel for business but now they got restrictions on travel nothing's going on overseas that's for sure i've heard of a lot of people canceling overseas trips and and uh places that they were going to go on vacation it just didn't happen and trying to plan things right now it's a little frustrating you know some of us we're just simply trying to find ways to deal with life where what's happening with us and around us and Ezekiel he's there he's in that kind of a situation and there's I think there's some important takeaways for us today and and it's one of them is this in it's God's desire for his people to have a change of heart he, he, he Ezekiel he, he he has a right to and he probably feels that he probably feels like I've got a right to, to kind of own this bitterness. You know, sometimes God wants us to reach out to people that we don't, we're not even sure we like those people, much less want to spend eternity with them. We don't even know if we want to spend the next five minutes with them. What is that? Well, God's trying to change Ezekiel's heart before he can speak to them. Look what it says. He came and he had to sit where they were. And for those, uh, uh, you know, we're learning to, to, to live with the, God's mission, his purpose, his plan at the forefront of what we do. We know that's the right thing, but it's not always the easy thing. As a Christ follower, we, we want to get better at trying to reach people. This is why I believe that, that this series, A New Heart, is timely. Could it be that all of us have in some way have stoniness in our hearts? That it's possible that we might not care about what God cares about at the core of who we are? Oh, we can give lip service. We can say amen in church when pastor's waxing eloquent, not necessarily me, but some pastor waxing eloquent about reaching the lost and at any cost or whatever we might say to try to motivate to, for all of us to do. The wise man win his souls. You're Christ's ambassador. You're the light of the world, salt of the earth. You're uh, a witness. God's given you power to be a witness and uh, you know to the world. We're saying, yeah, the world's fine. We'll, we'll do that as long as I don't have to confront my neighbor or that, uh, that nasty person that lives across the street from whatever the case might be. You, you with me? That, see, we, we, we don't always necessarily really genuinely care 
about all that God might be caring about. Well, you know, I care about me, <laughs> right? So doesn't God care about me? Well, yes, he does. As a matter of fact, he, he cares about all of us, right? I know he cares about me, but so I guess if I care about what God cares about, I'm good, right? Well, that may be true, but that might be limiting. See, that is not all that God cares about. Yes, he cares about you. We say that all the time, right? But he also cares about people who are on the brink and on the, the place in their journey where they're far from God, where they don't know who he is. Think of it. God cared enough about Israel in their exile, in their unyielding, obstinate, hardened state to reveal to Ezekiel and give him a fresh revelation of who God is and his glory in order to prepare him to, for what? To be a voice and to illustrate with his life what God was trying to say to his own countrymen. You know, that, that kind of hit me strong where it says, and, and I had this thought, before we can even maybe speak to this generation, we need to understand them. We need to try to figure out what's wiring them, what, how, what, they, what they feel and what they think. Verse 14 and 15, it says, the spirit lifted me up, took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit. But the strong hand of the Lord was upon me. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kibar River, and there where they were living, I sat among them for seven days. Just sat there, observed, listened, taking it in. And it says he was overwhelmed. You know, the, the, the presence of God in our lives does not remove from us the emotions or keep from us from feeling certain things. Ezekiel declares the Spirit lifted me up. He's declaring, may the glory of the Lord be praised in his dwelling. That's what he said first. Then the reality of what is happening in people's lives and how messed up they are, how far from God they are. And we, like Ezekiel, sometimes we can get angry. We can get bitter. So, honestly, sometimes I think, well, they're just getting what they deserve. <laughs> hey, I have to remind myself, maybe that's a callous place in my own heart of thinking that way because what did I deserve? What if I would have got what I deserved? It sure wouldn't be what I've got because by grace, God saved me by his mercy and I knew every morning. I deserve hell. He gave me heaven. And so sometimes I look in my heart now and I can have this little edge to my thinking, well, maybe it's just because of the choices that they've made. <laughs> I'm done with that. I, I don't even, you know, I... I don't even, well, maybe that's just me. But at some time, maybe what I really need is just to sit among them and realize the hopelessness and realize the blindness and realize where they're at and their worldview and try to listen and perceive and understand in a way that, that I might get overwhelmed, not just with, with my emotions, but overwhelmed with the burden, overwhelmed with the reality of the price that Jesus paid and the love that he has for all human beings. And so here, and I ask, how, have, you, have you ever felt overwhelmed? Ezekiel, he's having this strong emotional feeling that this is too much. The task is too great. And so often when we feel overwhelmed, we're unable to act or move forward. So I'm not sure that he was overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord, overwhelmed by the task. Some, the Bible just says he sat down, he's filled with these emotions, he's sitting among them, and he's overwhelmed. It's taken him a week to just adjust, to observe, to sit among the people that God was sending him to. I'll tell you what, I'm a firm believer in my life of praying with sight, on sight. I think just being in that scenario, any move that I've ever made, I remember uh, sensing that maybe God had something for me, calling me to, to, to further study, to answer this burden, this call, this desire to share the gospel. I remember a, a vision I had of sitting on a picnic table in the, this country farmhouse and trying to figure out ways to preach the gospel and kind of envisioning preaching and then seeing the, the wind blow. Uh, and, and the vision was kind of the word goes out, the wind, the spirit will move. And I, I saw it move and just all these corners stalks like just you know they're seven eight feet tall and they just begin to bow and just a vision of the power what god might be able to do could god could you use me to be able to accomplish something more and i remember 
then uh, finding out about Central Bible College and going and praying with site on site. And, and on my way to visit my parents out in Kansas, I went through Springfield, Missouri, and I walked that campus. campus and and I, I prayed and I said, God, is this where you want me? Is this where you're directing me? I'd heard about it and, and I could just sense that, that I needed to be there. I remember when we went to Peoria, going and praying with sites, sitting down with, with families, people who lived in the city and praying and just uh, asking God, is this where you are calling, Debbie and I? I remember when we got the, the, the awareness, when God began to speak to us about Indianapolis, we drove over here before we met anybody. We just kind of drove, looked at the church, drove around the city. We just wanted to pray with sight on sight. There's something about sitting among the people. There's something about just observing. Listen, if you're trying to figure out next steps, I encourage you. We're, we're taking this to heart when we're thinking about where's the harvest field? Where are you sending us? Who is it that you want us to reach? And we've been doing some prayerful uh, consideration and we're uh, mapping out how to prayer walk areas and see what God's trying to show us and sit among them, so to speak, pray among them and pray over them and say, God, I know you have a personal harvest for me individually. I believe he has a personal harvest for you and your Jerusalem and the people around you. I believe he has a personal, uh, has a, not just a personal, but a, a church-wide harvest that as we labor together, it's to build each other up, but it's also to gather in the those that God has said that they are for us to reach. So we're praying, we're believing God that as we go and as we pray, that we desire God to open up the fields of harvest as he declares they're already white to harvest. Jesus said, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Will you join us? That's what we're saying. Will you join me? Will you join your brothers and sisters? Would you begin to pray over the, the place where you are? Would you begin to maybe sit among where you're at and look around and just pray? Maybe open up our eyes and just, just sat, sit and listen. Maybe get overwhelmed with what God's heart is for those that are near us. Who is it that God might be sending you and I to? Part of this seven days was consecration. That, that was a pattern for priesthood if, if you were among unclean things. So, so I think the seven days is significant for Ezekiel. Maybe it was a time where he's understanding God's moving something. He's showing him some things and he's ready to speak into his life on some issues and to prepare him for what he's wanting to do. And maybe these seven days wasn't just to observe around, but maybe it was consecration of his own heart, his own life to be prepared to be able to be used of God. The word of the Lord has come into my spirit of late that, that the task is great, but we are not ready for the task. As a church, that, 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 I'm not not sure what that means exactly, but we are asking God, get us ready. Because we want to be ready to welcome and receive what you want to pour out. We want to welcome and receive the people and the lives that you want us to interact with. And so we're earnestly praying. Uh, we're consecrating. Consecration is needed on the part of the church so that God can speak and we're ready to listen and obey. Like Ezekiel, he took that time. I don't know if it'll take seven days, seven weeks, seven months, seven years. I'm not sure. I hope it doesn't take, but I, here's the point. We got we to gotta pursue it and let God help us to see what it is that he wants and then us be willing to listen and to do in response to that. Sometimes our attitude, our anger over the lifestyle choices others are making has a negative effect on our emotional attitude. We might be angry and bitter, not able to speak the truth in love. We need the time to consecrate ourselves before the Lord. Too often we're like the, the priests or the Levites that when we are confronted by an opportunity to help someone, we're kind of like the men that pass by. You know, the good Samaritan in that story, is he picked the Samaritan for a reason because there was animosity between the Jews and the Samaritan. So him saying a Samaritan, he's saying, listen, the ones that should have had compassion on the man didn't. The one that you think that isn't got anything going on in their life, he's the one that took time, picked him up, bandaged his womb, said, hey, I'll be back. Anything he needs, I'll take care of. The Samaritan did what Jesus would do. And that was the point of what he's saying. And I think sometimes we're like the Levi. We pass by on the other side. It's too messy. It's a situation. We just don't want to take the time or we don't have the compassion necessary to be impactful. We subtly think that we're just getting what they deserve and too bad. Sorry about you. And I say, God, that's a stony place in my heart. Get that out. I want you to shape and mold my heart. I need to, God to give me a new heart, a heart of compassion, and get rid of the stoniness of my own heart. God has something to say, I believe, to both the 
the wicked and the righteous that we went, that that I read in Ezekiel 3. In other words, he has something to say really to all of us. Ezekiel's role in the process was to be a watchman. A watchman was one who was stationed on the walls of a city to warn people of the danger of the approach of or uh, messengers coming to their city. Ezekiel was to warn them that each person is responsible for his or her own behavior. That's, uh, that's really the gist of what he's saying. Whether they were wicked or whether they were righteous, about to stumble, they're about to get off track. The key is that, it, one, he says everybody is responsible and you are responsible when you see that to warn them, that, like that watchman on the wall. That they're in danger. Ezekiel was to warn them that each person is responsible for his or her own behavior. But God told Ezekiel, I've made you a watchman. You need to be my mouthpiece to warn the wicked and the righteous. If you don't, that's on you. But if you warn the wicked, if you warn the righteous and they turn or don't turn, from whatever their decision is, that's the, you will have delivered your soul. You will have done what I want you to do. You'll be able to hear the Lord say, well done. You did what I asked you to do. Now understand, we're not the Savior. People are not our projects to try to fix their problems. In fact, we have no real ability to fix anyone, right? We've just got a message of hope. We've got the gospel. We just proclaim this wonderful truth that Jesus is Lord, that he is the one who rescues us from sin, washes us, cleanses us, and renews and frees our life and gives us real freedom, enables us to live in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. So our role is to give the word of God, to give others a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. God says that he'll empower He'll help us. He'll give us what we need, directions on how he wants his message delivered. You know, everything has God's timing. And in verse 24 to 27, God's timing was attached to Ezekiel's life. He tells Ezekiel, go shut yourself in the house and bind these ropes on you, and you cannot go out among them. Uh, you know, okay, God, which is it? Right? You want me to go? You want me to just stay? He said, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to, Stick, I'm going to make your tongue go thicky, <laughs> like mine is right now. You can't hardly talk. That you won't even be able to speak. It'll be like eating peanut butter. You know, your, your tongue can be stuck to the roof of your mouth. And you won't even be able to speak. That's what God, God says I'm going to do to you. I'm going to make you mute. Uh, boy, there's times I wish God would have done that. I could have saved myself some grief. I, mean, I said some things that I shouldn't have said. Can you relate? I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But nonetheless, in, in the midst of it, he says, in other words, he finally says, but when I do loose the bind, when I do give you permission to speak, when I do tell you, I, you will open your mouth and you shall say to them thus. In other words, boy, that, that kind of said to me, you know what, sometimes I just run with it and just, I, I don't know. I say, Lord, out of my heart, help me to speak what you want spoken. Man, Jesus, it says of him that he, did what he saw the Father doing. He spoke what he heard the Father speaking. Man, Lord, help me to walk with you and step with the Spirit. If need be, tie my hands so I don't get out of bounds. If need be, let my tongue get tied to the roof of my mouth so I don't speak out of turn. But when I do speak, Lord, help me to speak as an oracle for you. Help me to have the tongue of a ready writer. Help me to speak the truth in love. Help me to care about where people are, are headed in their life and, and to learn and to grow and, and to try to understand and build rapport and relationship and listen more than I speak. Maybe that's some, that's, a, I'm, I'm just, I think that's for me this morning that I need to remind myself, listen, if you'll listen, then when you do speak, you'll be able to speak what I want spoken. In other words, when God is prompting us to speak or to do anything, the most important lesson I think I'd take away from Ezekiel in this chapter is it's about obedience. Not the results. If we'll be obedient to do what God wants done, not everyone we speak to, not everyone we share the message of Jesus' love and grace and compassion and concern for their life will respond the way God wants them to respond. We are not responsible for the decisions or the actions or the inactions of those who might be like the Israelites who were obstinate, stubborn, and somewhat rebellious. But like Ezekiel, 
in that moment, we're fulfilling the role of a watchman, issuing the warning, letting them know heaven's real. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin cuts you off from God. But Jesus came to be your sin bearer. He who knew no sin became sin for you. That's a, what a message, isn't it? He literally became my sin on the cross. My sin put him there. He didn't deserve that. I did. But he did it out of his love for you, for me, and for this whole world. It's that heart that I want to have and want God to keep renewing inside of us so that when he wants us to speak, we'll speak. You know, it reminds me of the warnings that come from the weather center. <laughs> uh, we've kind of become amateur weathermen trying to figure out what to do on Sundays and we'll continue to do that. But I'm thinking about some of the warnings that come. You know, a hurricane season comes and there's warnings sometimes. I think of Katrina back in 2005. You know, they had days to prepare. But over 1,800 people didn't listen to the warning. And more than that, we're, were completely overwhelmed by that Cat 5 hurricane. And the warnings had come, but they didn't listen. A million plus people did. They moved out and got away from harm's way. But 1,800 people, all of them heard the same warnings. All of them saw the, knew that it was coming, but not all responded the same way. And 1,800 people lost their lives. They waited too late. We read that in Noah's day, he was a preacher of righteousness. He warned of the judgment to come, but only eight were saved. I don't know how many, all humanity beyond that, that heard the message, the warning of judgment to come. They mocked, they scoffed, they didn't believe it would happen. But it happened, and they lost out. I just want to close, I guess, with these, these thoughts from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Paul, first he expresses this, his sincere desire. He says in verse 1, Romans 10, it's my earnest prayer and sincere desire for all of Israel to be saved. You know what he's saying? He's saying, my, my, the people I live around, the people I know, the nation I'm from, man, isn't that the way? We, we, it's my earnest prayer and, and desire before God that all America be saved. Really, I could say that about every nation, even all China, all Indonesia, all India. God so loved, he, he, he gave his life for the, the whole world. But he says this, he says that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow, isn't that awesome? But then he goes on to say, well, how can they call on someone that they don't even know exists? How can they call unless if they don't believe? And how can they believe in whom they've not heard? See, we've got one job to do, really, <laughs> to know him and to make him known, to be a watchman in our city. I guess the key is, trying to learn how to relate, sit with, sit with them, relate with them, be overwhelmed, not with our emotional feelings or opinions about how they're living their life. Listen, sinners are going to sin. <laughs> people full of hatred are going to hate. Doubters are going to doubt. Immoral people are going to act immorally. The only one that can rectify that is, is the one we love and the one who loves them, whose name is Jesus. We're watchmen. May the Lord help us to know how to sit with people, see where they're at, understand, and try to connect them to Christ and warn them as God tells us and encourages us how to communicate his love and grace and truth to them where they're at. A new heart. You know, do we, do we care about what he cares about? He cares about you. He cares about me. I care about that too. But he cares about a whole lot more than that. He cares about a lost world. And, here, and we're his plan. We're the people that God's going to use. And I believe that the Lord helps us. And he's going to, if we'll say, Lord, who can I help? Who can I demonstrate your love and grace true to? He, he'll help us. Maybe it's you. Maybe you tuned in today. Maybe your heart hasn't been right with the Lord. Today's a good day. It's as many as receive him. He gives you the right to be become a son of the Most High, even to those who believe on his name. Let's pray today. Father, thank you. Lord, I don't know who I might be speaking to today, but I pray, first of all, for those of us who profess Christ. Lord, that you would move the things that are in our heart, the, 
the, the anguish or the, the, the bitterness or the anger that we might feel towards certain uh, lifestyles or activities that we don't love them. We, if we're honest, we, we're like Ezekiel. It makes us bitter and angry. We just need to get, sit with them and be overwhelmed by the reality that you love them and you don't want them to perish. That you're on the cross and you're saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And Lord, I pray that you teach us your ways and help us to speak when you want us to speak. Do what you want us to do. Help us to demonstrate your love and grace. Make us watchmen who recognize that we aren't responsible for what other, how other people respond, but we are responsible. That when you ask us to do something, we need to do it. So Lord, help us. And if there's someone today that hasn't crossed that line over to, from death to life, from, faith, from doubt to faith, the word says it's right there in your mouth. Just open up your mouth. Call on Jesus. He'll hear your call. And he'll answer. He'll do great and mighty things in your life. He'll give you a new heart. He'll take out the stony places. He'll put his spirit upon you. And he'll change your life for now and forever. In Jesus' name. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, let us know if there's something that we can do to help you on your journey. We're here, 82nd and Hague. Uh, we're, we're live on Sundays, either inside or outside. If you feel free to, to, to come join us, uh, come. If we're inside, right now we're wearing masks outside. We don't have to. We social distance. It may not look like it, but we are. We're doing our best. Anyway, God bless you. Have a great day. Enjoy what God has for you uh, this day and, uh, and forever. He's a good, good God, and he has good things in mind for you. God bless. Amen. Stop, 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 stop.